Welcome to the April Java user group meeting. So we have this one in every month. I actually changed a little bit. We, are, um, we have a meetup.com group, and that's probably the most reliable way to get meeting announcements and information and stuff about what we're doing. So if you just search for Toronto Java user group on meetup.com in Toronto, you'll find us. Uh, we've also got a mailing list at tjug.ca. You can go there, um, sign up, and we try to announce the meetings on the mailing list, which we might subscribe to the meetup.com or figure out some way to hook them together. And um, yep, yeah. we do. Yeah. <laughs> yep. If you go to the meetup.com, you can also post comments about the meeting, and you can do little discussions there too. And. Uh, yeah, we record all of these and post them to YouTube, and you can get links on meetup.com or on our videos page. So definitely check those out. So uh, Java news this month. It is the official end of public support from Oracle for Java 7. Um, so if you're still using Java 7 uh, free versions, then you're going to lose security patches and bug fixes and all sorts of stuff unless you switch to an alternative JVM that is still supporting, or you pay Oracle. So you can, I think they're actually having paid support for another seven years or something on, on Java 7, but it's uh, pretty pricey to get those patches. And if you are still using Java 7, you should be using Java 8. Just switch. It's, it's mature, it's awesome, it's faster, it's better. Just if, if you... If, if you did, you should probably file a bug because it should just work. <laughs> uh, Java 1 2015 is coming up. Uh, I think the CFP is closed. Uh, no, they extended it. Oh, they extended it. Yeah. Cool. So you can still still put in papers. Um, you can buy tickets right now. If you buy them before the end of May, they're 1450, and if you buy them at the conference, they're 2050. And they usually offer some sort of discount for, for Jug members. But I haven't seen that published yet. So when we find out more, then we'll share that with everybody. Um, and the sooner you book your hotels and flights, if you think you're going to Java 1, you think you might be going to Java 1, even if you book a hotel and cancel it, you <laughs> book a hotel. Like, it gets ridiculous. Yeah, and if you wait till the conference, it'll be five hundred dollars a night. Yeah, yeah. Last time I went, I last minute booked, and it was like four hundred bucks a night out by the airport. So yeah, it gets insane. And Airbnb is the same way. If you want to do that, those will all be sold out too. <laughs> um, not entirely Java, but kind of cloudy. I don't know uh, if you're an AWS user, you might have heard about this. Um, they are finally offering cloud file services that aren't S3. So you can just NFS mount this new file system that they've got. Um, one of the biggest complaints was how to share files between your instances. And could you mount a block store between them? And of course you can't. So now they've got this NFS thing, which is really awesome. It's not available yet, but uh, it's supposed to be launched in the summer. And it's all supposed to be reliable and not supposed to lose your data and all of that good stuff. I yep. I love it when they say it. <laughs> <laughs> not supposed to lose your data. Uh, Wildfly released their version 9 beta, which is really cool. It's got some neat new features. It's got HTTP2, and it's got speedy support. So if you want to play with next generation web tech, that's a good way to do it. Um, they've improved their load balancer that um, looks at a lot more metrics. And they've also made a super light distribution with uh, just the servlet spec. Um, so it's kind of like what you might have used Tomcat for. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, Jonathan sent this to me uh, yesterday, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, there's been a group that have, I think maybe one person, so it's a small yeah. project, but he's uh, implemented operator overloading in Java using the annotation processor. 
So if you've been missing operator overloading and you want to make your code less readable, this is a great way to do it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's true. He's like, this is a neat trick. But you can see they've um, defined uh, a plus operator on lists. And that just concatenates them. So that's kind of neat. You know, they've, they've done this. So you can start to make double with more like I think so, yeah. Um, this is another neat thing I came across, this, this uh, Zembly, which is trying to be kind of like S XSLT. And this kind of caught my attention because it's a problem that we had to solve at work not too long ago, uh, which is how to patch an XML file quickly and easily. And these guys have come up with an assembly-like language where you give it an X path and then give a couple uh, operations on it. So you can um, add in new nodes and add uh, attributes and things like that using these little scripts. So I thought that was kind of cool. It's supposed to be light. It's a pretty early project, so it's, I don't think it's in Maven Central. I don't think it's just as easy as like adding a Maven thing to your project yet, but uh, looks like it's pretty cool. It's a, it's a neat idea, just make an assembly language. All right, uh, so that, that's the news, and our, our speaker, uh, Todd, will tell us about app development for Android. All right. Uh, Good, good, good evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is basically going to serve as a, uh, an introduction to uh, Java on Android. It's not going to get anything too deep. This is sort of going to get into the surface, just give you the basics of what you need to know uh, to do a, uh, an Android app. Most of uh, basically what I'm presenting is stuff I started learning back in, in about probably, I guess, late December, just saying, oh, you know, I just started looking at Android saying, this would be neat. What happens? And just, I ended up building uh, my own little app that I've actually released on Google Play and part of, you know, what I'm talking about will be based on that experience. Um, when, when I said to Jonathan, I said, I can do lots and lots of slides, talk about Android penetration based on whatever. He's like, no, just don't do a lot of slides. Just show some code. So these are very minimal slides just to sort of make a few points and then we'll get into actually, uh, running some code and showing some basic uh, Android apps. Um, you know, we were just having that discussion about uh, Java version uh, for Lollipop, which is version 5, which is not actually on a, out on a lot of Android devices. Uh, it, uh, it's Java 1.7. There is no Java 1.8 on Android currently. Maybe there will be in future versions of Android, but not now. You can actually get along just fine doing Java 1.6, which would be kind of nice to have 1.8 because there's some very great uses for Java Lambda expressions in Android, but unfortunately, uh, we just uh, aren't there yet. Um, so what does the IDE look? How do we do it? I just put in Android Java God, use VI, because quite, if you want, you can do the whole development with command line tools using VI and that kind of stuff. You know, For most of us, though, you know, we, we have you know better things to do with our time, so there are, you know, so there are IDE available. So if you want to use VI, I'll salute you and even buy you a beer. But um, for the rest of us, it's uh, we're using Android App Studio. I say sorry, Eclipse fans, because back around uh, December, it used to be Eclipse. If you looked up Google and said, oh, what's your, what's your default? You know, IDE. How do I develop apps for Android? They'd walk you through Eclipse. They say oh, they had all these tools for Eclipse. And blah blah blah. I think it was about the end of December, early January, they pulled all the uh, Eclipse stuff. So although you can still do Android apps in Eclipse, it's no longer supported by Google. There will be no more future um, Eclipse development by Google. So currently it's Android App Studio, which is actually based on the community version of IntelliJ, which is actually what I'm going to be showing in this uh, little talk here. Uh, how do we test our apps? You know, wh where do we deploy them? One of the things I'll be showing just for this demonstration are they called AVDs or Android Virtual Devices. They're essentially uh, you know little virtual machines that we can that we can run uh, and you know Android code on. Um, ideally, though, I based on my experiences, I strongly discourage using the Android uh, virtual devices because once your uh, your code starts to do anything of any value, your whole machine just sort of comes to a uh, a halt because we're running Java on top of our 
or Java IDE, what I strongly suggest you do is um, develop using real Android devices. Android develop, you know, devices such as phones, tablets, watches, TV, and apparently there is a Glass 2.0 coming down the road, but that's just the rumor. I'm, I'm not going to explain about Android devices. I'm assuming people here are familiar with what Android is, and some of you may even own Android devices yourself. Um, one of the things to do is uh, how do we deploy our apps? It's, it'll be great. You know, we're going to develop these apps, but it might be nice at some point to share our apps with uh, with our, you know, with you know, with the community at large or with other people. Um, the 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 biggest way currently right now to uh, to uh, deploy an app is Google Play. Most of our devices are plugged into uh, Google Play. Um, I will actually show you um, the uh, developer side of Google Play, so you get an idea of you know you've probably if you have a if you've used Google you've probably you know at some point downloaded something off of Google Play, but you haven't seen maybe what the Play Store looks like from the developer's point of view. So we'll actually show you what the um, developer side of things look like using an actual app. The other option we have too is called sideloading apps, where basically you can circumvent the uh, Google Play Store. In order to do that, most Android devices have a little security option that says um, allow, um, allow from unknown sources. As long as your unknown sources is not clicked, you cannot sideload any apps. But once you do allow, you will have to enable sideloading of apps, not just to you know, deploy apps you know, just on their own, but also so you can do development. As well, if you, you may not be aware of this, there's a myriad of other Android app stores out there. One of the things, for instance, if you, do de if you develop a Google or an Android de device, pardon me, your search engine must be set for Google, you know, for, for Google search. If you do not use Google search, you as a manufacturer of an Android device are not allowed to use the Google Play Store. As such, there's a lot of people who don't conform to those rules. And there are other Play Stores out there. One example would be uh, Amazon has their own app store. And the Amazon App Store does not use Google as the default search. So they, they can't use it. All right, and that's basically it. You know, we'll, we'll get away, we'll get out of the slides and I'll show you just sort of um, some of the code here. Um, this, uh, one of the things here I'm just going to do here is I'll show you. First off, we'll get things as far as a. Uh, I'm currently uh, your 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 your, cur your choices for, uh, for for development, basically as far as your OSs go, are Windows, Linux, and um, and, and Apple. My, my my personal preference, based on what I've done, I've done Windows, but the moment the app started doing stuff, just Windows. So I actually switched to Linux. This is Fedora 21, works quite nicely. Um, if you go, this is the, the, the Android SDK manager. There's a whole bunch of tools in here that come with, that, that they provide that not only allow you to update your libraries, but will allow you to, uh, you know, they have debugging tools and a whole bunch of other things. I'm using this because I want to use the tools feature here to say what they call the manage AVDs. I have one already created here, but this is just, what we can do is uh, we can edit it here, because what I want to show you, you give it a name. Here for your device, we have, uh, a myriad of devices. The Nexus 7 is a tablet, 5, 6, 9. They have different sizes. We can do here, we can do Android Wear Round, Square, which are, are watches. We can do the television, different screen densities. Uh, for this one, we're just going to go with the Google 5. Uh, we can change screen sizes, a keyboard. Uh, typically what I recommend, because most of us are probably using Intel-based um, CPUs, is for your CPU, use an Intel-based you know, for, for, your, for your AVD if you happen to use one, because there is, uh, you know, a you know, few other uh, architectures available, but they will crawl. Typically use the, uh, use the Intel one on an Intel processor. You can simulate front cameras, back cameras. You can play with the memory. We can create an internal, store, internal storage. We can do an SD card. And that's basically that. So if we go here and we hit start, and we just launch, and then we wait and we make small talk for about the next 30 seconds while this thing fires up. What we'll, what we'll do first is we're going to fire up the uh, device because when I want to show, because ideally what would happen is I would not, I would actually run the code on my own device. The problem is if I'm sitting here <laughs> deploying uh, code on my uh, little phone here trying to show you what the code looks like running, it's going to be really difficult. So I just fire it up. 
a uh, virtual device here. And you can see it's like we have our own little phone running on the PC. Basically, this, this runs exactly like a, um, like uh, one of the things about the Android uh, virtual devices is there's something called the ADB, the Android Debug Tool, which you can use for, you can, you can remap the ports, you can do all sorts of other little cute things. This will work exactly because I'm on the internet. We can do, you know, internet searches. We can go back, we can do anything. If I open the, uh, one of the cute things you can do with it, this is actually opening the actual Google, but if I go to, uh, oh. you have to use the, uh, I keep forgetting here, but it's like, so if we go to uh, no, 10 point, oh, point 2.2, point because this may be something you may want to do at some, you can't really see it, but it says, hello, Toronto Java user group. But what we've actually done is 10.0.2.2 is actually the local loopback device on my Linux laptop running here, which is actually an Apache server, because let's say you say, because if you, if you on this, on the virtual device, if you were to put, you know, the IP4 address, you know, 10.0.0.1, you'd be hitting any server running on your virtual Android device. But just using this little cute thing, you can use this IP address, and you can hit your, uh, you know, you can run local servers on your, on your machine for development purposes. So that's basically the, uh, the virtual device up and running that we'll be using for, for testing. Now, can we fire up Android uh, Studio? Uh, you, you'll get a screen similar to this. It shows recent projects. You have your ability you know, to do quick starts. We'll start a new Android Studio project for this one. And we give it a name. My, this is my company domain, so it always defaults to that. So. Here we go, give it a name, just that. And then one of the things too, you give the option, it says, all right, target Android devices. It gives you, there are different <coughs> ability, you know, basically what the options it's presenting here are the, um, are the uh, ver versions of Android I, I have deployed here. Currently, I can only go as low as 4.0. I could, if I wanted to install, if you wanted to do 2.2, you can install it. But one of the things it says here is, when you select your minimum SDK, it'll say here, approximately how many devices you're going to be able to run your app on. If I go to 5.1 Lollipop, it says here fewer than, less than 1% of my devices are going to be able to run any code. Typically what you do is you, you specify a minimum and then you'll specify a target. For this, we'll say 4.0. You have the ability here, you can do TV, you can do Wear, you can do Glass, so, and it'll give you default apps you can start with. This one will just start with the phone tablet version. Uh, they give you a few different things here. The one I'm working with is just the blank activity. This is kind of the, the one that gets you started, but you have, you know, they give you a few more here and you have a few more that you can expand on. And then if I hit next, and then we'll just, and this is the main activity. Main activity is sort of like your main in an application. This is going to be the main entry point into the, uh, into the Android app. Hit finish. And then if we wait for a minute or two it hmm. oh, there we go yeah it uses gradle as the um, to do to manage the build if you want to plug into uh, maven you can or you can use maven but the, the default build environment for a uh, for an Android for, for an Android app is Gradle. One of the things you can do with Gradle is um, you can actually deploy multiple versions of your app targeted at multiple versions of the uh, OS. Because one of the things uh, Android is notorious for, if you if you read any book that's or any see any code that was done l like back in 2013, guaranteed most of all those functions have all been deprecated. They all have new versions. They, they deprecate probably a lot of the stuff uh, about once every year. So if you really say, I really want to do 2.3 or something, but we'll just. Oh. 
This is typically, too, why I don't like to run the, uh, the virtual devices on top of when I'm doing Android App Studio, because this would be running a lot faster if I wasn't. And I'll be confess, this isn't the, uh, the, gr the greatest laptop out there. It's a little old. Typically, when I'm doing actual app development, I actually, I actually run my, uh, my apps on a, uh, on a uh, pardon me, on actual devices. If you plug in through USB, you, you can debug, you can deploy, you can do all that stuff. Right now, it's trying to, it's trying to put all the, uh, uh, the, co the code together. Right now we're indexing, it's like dum da dum. So this is where, so how's everybody liking the, the, you know, the presentation so far, we'll make small talk. Well, this is uh, going through. Um, one of the things, uh, just wait for. How much memory does that? Memory? Oh, we're, it, it uses a fair bit. You know, we, we got a fair, actually, I think right now that's probably part of the problem is actually what I'm going to do is here. We'll, Gonna kill that just to free up the memory so things will. There we go. Right now. Pardon? I thought Eclipse was slow. Yeah, no, this, it's doing it's indexing. Earlier, I pro I made the mistake of updating the IDE, which is probably part of the reason why it's uh, mm. trying to figure. No, well, but. Yeah. But um, you know, one, one, of the, well, one of the things too, I'll mention just about uh, what while we're waiting here for everything to uh, f fire up is. Uh, but what ha and I'll mention it is there's um, what, what what happens is is like the, with there is a in that, in Android there's a basically everything sort of is based around activities. Those are the those are the building blocks of um, of Android. There is something. I, I'm not covering in this talk called fragments, which are essentially like little um, activities can be thought of as these own little independent sort of pages, units of, of functioning code inside the app. Um, with the latest version of, uh, of Android, they've now introduced fragments, which essentially insert even more little self blocks of independent code into your already existing code so you can put all these different the idea being you can do because uh, one of the things too I'll mention about devices is that um, when you're developing for Android one of the considerations you have to consider is there are different screen sizes there's like you know we have the phone we have the tablet the other thing to consider is there's also two orientations you have to consider you have to consider portrait and you have to consider landscape like for instance when I was developing my uh, my, my one app that I deployed I actually had to create different la I had to create Think about what was it about four different actually it was worked out to about four different layouts one for portrait one for landscape so when you're doing uh, so once you start doing anything of any real value as far as your screen layout goes you have to give thought to you're going to have different screen layouts is one of the things with uh, Android 2 is you can have multiple languages it's designed that you can set up if you want different layouts or different things for different uh, and we're almost there give me a little but um, Oh, there we go. And everything. So this will initial basically what, what what happens is when you first start off in uh, when when you create a uh, new app, it's going to start you off in the uh, in the in the GUI builder because the one thing I'll just start up my other virtual device here while we wait for that to. Yeah, I'll, 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 sh I'll deal with that. But one of the things just to consider is, all right, so we've, we've loaded up Android uh, App Studio. I'll fix the rendering problem uh, a little bit. But basically, it starts up. The one thing to consider is that uh, just, just in general, you have, um, this is your, ba th they have the Android, which just sort of flattens the actual layout of it because of your, uh, the, 
but yeah, this is actually sort of because when you get into the uh, the value uh, when you actually get into the because what happens is is your, your your Android app basically is is all stuck into an APK file. Inside that APK file, we're going to find source files. We're going to find XML files for layouts for strings, and we can you can also do different graphics for different sizes of devices. Also, if you're getting into games you can, and other stuff like that, you can actually start considering different pixel densities of your screen. This one here, we have layout, we have support. In here, we have our, uh, our application. Um, the, bit, the one thing you, you want to, uh, and is here we have, uh, we have our, you know, different things for terminal, for messages, for Android, for event log. But um, one, one of the things here we'll just show is um, one of the, the entry points into your, uh, and so in here, if we go through that here, just show you, we have in the layout, this is the, the, the activity main specifies, uh, this is an XML file, I'll show you a little, what a thing, we can do menus, so you can do your menu options, values for strings, one of the things, if we look at, You know everything is done in. Uh, it's going to complain about that, but I'll I'll deal with that. So, um, what one of the thing when you when you first one of the things you have, you, you want to consider is all right. So so we've built a uh, we've built an app. How does Android know what to do with it? We can deploy this APK file, and it's going to want to know. All right, so if we go to the, uh, the, the Android manifest, uh, one of the things we, uh, we have in here, because this is the, the entry point of into, the, uh, into the actual, uh, so basically what happens is first thing you want to do when you uh, look at a, when you try to install an, an app onto Android is it's going to, uh, in here you can specify permissions, which is something I'll get into because uh, basically an Android app on the Android environment is uh, incredibly sandboxed. You can't access the network. You, you can't do a lot of stuff until you give permission. So you add them into the, uh, into the Android manifest in here. Basically, so we, we specify package name. One of the things we have in here is, um, is, the, is you have the uh, activity. In here, we have because we, we have all these main activities, and we get to let you know we can have as many as we want, but we have to uh, specify the activities. Like we have one here called main activity. It gets it you know if you go through the XML, it's sort of it, they have an intent filter called basically whatever activity gets the intent filter of uh, Android intent action main is going to be the first activity that is that is run uh, by Android when it first uh, fires up. We have uh, uh, this is. I'm just changing the. Uh, change the theme here.
All right, so there we go. So this is kind of, so what we have here is that you have like, you have the GUI built, like just so that's sort of, you know, so this is activity main.xml is the XML file. All the, um, essentially all the, all the screen layouts in Android, you, you, can, you have two ways of doing it. You can do them in XML or you can do them programmatically. Typically you sort of start with an XML layout here and then we have, uh, or you can do a uh, design version here. If we, uh, so it's quite possible if you want to do your entire, uh, you know, just to do your entire app using uh, using XML, except it kind of defeats the purpose of doing app development because you can just do a bunch of static things in here. So here, this one, this is actually doing the uh, the Hello World. So if we wait, just there we go. And then if we, f and then if we f launch it, here I'll just show you what, just to show you what Hello World, just to get Hello World started up here, it'll. Build, it takes about, a, takes about uh, 25 seconds. Then you get a message saying, oh, where do you want to run it? And we'll run it on the uh, Android uh, virtual device here. And then this will. Because you know when you do when you do it on the uh, without the uh, you know that I'm only doing the the virtual device here just because it's easier for uh, for development when it uh, and then what it'll do it'll first time it runs it asks you where you want to run it because one of the things you can do with um, you know in the Android App Studio is you can plug in multiple devices so we can plug in the um, it says here choose running device we'll say run it on the emulator and. Uh, We'll go. Now here, and there we go. Hello world is now running on a, uh, 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 you know, on, on the virtual device. If I wanted, I could package it right now, publish it to Google Play, and everybody could go. You could download Hello World on your thing. Um, if we don't, uh, if we don't like the text for whatever reason, we can see. One of the things that you, you can do is um, by rights, you shouldn't have in this. If you're doing any form of text. You should uh, you should actually do a reference. This one here actually does it to a strings file because what you can do these strings files can be configured for mu for multiple languages. So you really should put all your strings. So if you want to do uh, so, if I want to say hello T jug, and then I want to run. Oops. So use use same device for future launches, and I've just changed the text. Which, let's be honest, on its own, is kind of boring, you know, because you know we can just sit here and do text in XML. But that kind of defeats the purpose of uh, doing uh, any form of you know. Because we can also one of the things we can do here is we can do it programmatically, which I think is probably the preferred way to do. One of the things I'm going to do here. In order so that I know where to do the reference, as I'm adding, I, basically I add it an ID. Okay, There's gonna be anything, but basically, um, Basically, we can give it an ID. So one of the things what'll happen here is uh, if we go into now, this is the actual activity, main activity.java. 
uh, the uh, class file we want to pay. Basically, what will happen is it will enter here on the on create, and basically one line here called set content view, our layout activity main basically takes the XML file we did, blows it up, and renders it. If I uh, so, if we take a uh, a reference to the uh, Find view by ID, and then there's this there's this programmatic uh, R class file that basically is generated by the compiler that has a reference to this. So now if I go set text, so now we just make up some text, run it again. And then it'll run, and then it will. Uh, so now what we've done is we've just changed the text programmatically through. So, so instead of like, we move beyond the XML, so the big thing to consider when you're looking at your GUIs is we have the builder, we have the XML file, you can play with it, but we can do stuff uh, programmatically. One of the things, too, is to sort of the other thing just to consider now that we sort of is that main activities, things you want to remember is that. Um, Main activities can't from just from from uh, just from basic functions can't do things like anything with latency. You can't open network connections from your main activity because um, the main activity has to be incredibly responsive. Any activity that you try to do in your code that is going to impede the um, the you know could slow down the responsiveness of the app, uh, the the Android OS will kill right away. So typically, what you want to do is let's say you do want to open a network connection. You want to uh, they have uh, you want to use threads run your do whatever your network connections in your threads and uh, do, do, uh, do it that you know activities themselves have life cycles they, they can be uh, they can be created they can be paused uh, they can be destroyed uh, that kind of stuff uh, it's one of the things too we can do here just to sort of show you is we can do uh, if I go here and add a button just for these are sort of just show you. These are some of the widgets. There's even more out there. Um, just add a large. We'll just add a button here for the. Nothing too exciting. What I can do here though is. It will. Yeah. If we actually go here. It, it will add all the. We'll change this because that'll be. It, it'll add all this, and then, and there's like there's there's more things you can cover for what you want to do for. But one of the things too here is we can do for this is I've created a button. You sort of see a habit here, ID dot. All right, so this basically gets a reference to the button. Now we can set up. We have we have two, we have two ways of doing things. One thing's about buttons. We can do uh, we can do a um, an on click listener programmatically, or we can do. Basically, now, so now what we've done is we've created a new uh, on-click listener for the button. Uh, one of the things uh, I'm going to show you here, because you know, it's your um, is uh, it would be nice at some point. You know, how, how do you debug your app? How do we know what's going on? We have the uh, the log 
function here. So we can say, I just wanted to show how we can do some of the basic So now if we were to run the app again, there's an option here for, uh, for logcat, which it will. Oh, what did we do here? Pardon? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, stupid. Oh, no, that's what I did. I know what I did. Oh. Hello. Well, it's an XML issue, so. Oh, there we go. Oh. Yep. All right, there we go. So then, yeah, apologize for that little snafu, but you actually see, uh, if we go here, in Logcat, I just created a, uh, see, I can sit here, click it all I want. And I've just created log events. So we can do that. We can play with that. So that's essentially uh, debugging in a nutshell. One of the things here so we'll do here just to show something. We've already demonstrated crashing, but we'll crash it one more time. One of the things uh, it
So if we go here, basically what I'm going to try to do is figure out what the, uh, the Wi-Fi status is. And if I do it, it should, if I know what I'm doing, crash. Because I'll show you what's going to happen. This is actually, oh. Uh, there we go. We just barfed. Unfortunately, it stopped. And the reason, because what happens is. So if we go here and look up, it says uh, we, it says here, no security exception, neither user or current process has Android permission to access Wi-Fi state. One of the things you'll probably get into when you first start trying to develop Android is you're gonna run afoul of the uh, security mechanisms of Android. I sort of put this in just to you know, just to screw up the uh, with that. So if we go here into the, uh, there's the Android manifest here, which I showed. One of the things we do in here is you, uh, and then we can hit here, we can say access Wi-Fi state. Because one of the things, if you've ever had to install a, uh, an Android app, you've probably at some point seen it say, uh, oh, do you want to, you know, this permission, want, this app wants these permissions to do uh, that. So now, having added that, if we're to run it again, Yeah, it'll, it'll say this wants this permissions because one of the things the what, what one of the things that Android will do is it will look at the user's permissions and that's how it'll determine. So now we can hit the new button all we want and not run afoul of the Android security mechanism because it sandboxes your app a lot. It won't. You really can't talk to other apps. You can't access network, access the Wi-Fi. There's a whole lot of other um, devices in there that it will um, that it's going to. Uh, prevent you from uh, trying to, until you give permissions, because the, the default is to uh, sandbox everything. Now, this is kind of, you know, on its own, it's, uh, it's kind of boring, because ideally you might want to connect to other, th to other things. So that's the, the one thing I wanted to show was the, you know, when you're first getting started, because you'll have to, you know, if you want to access the network, that kind of stuff, you, ne you need the uh, permissions. Now, um, if you go here and go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go here and create a new activity so we can show you how everything sort of, you have all your, you have all your different types, you know, they have different, op we'll just go with another blank activity. It gives you, what do you want to call the name, call it, new activity, nothing too exciting there. All right, so now we have a, uh, here, it does a, so now what we'll do is I'm just going to, for fun here, if this is the activity new, is I'm just going to add a, uh, we have a clock here, just for, Analog clock. Now, th this brings up the, uh, the the next big thing I wanted to say is, well, how do we fire up the uh, – because now we, now we have the button. We don't really need this stuff. But uh, one, one, of the, one of the things I want to introduce, too, the other big concept you need to understand in Android is intents. Intents are kind of how we glue everything together. It's how apps can, can how activities can start other activities, how apps can call other apps. Let's say you want a picture, you know, but you want to get a picture from the camera. What you do is you would create an intent 
to uh, to use the camera, and then once the camera is done, it would fire off and it would fire another intent that would that would pass off your data. One of the things intents come intents come in two basic forms. One is explicit, is one it is implicit. Impl impl explicit basically means we say we want to load this activity, we want to use the camera, we want to do this. The other thing we can do too is we can say implicit. We can we can basically say we want to send a uh, an email message. Here's what it's going to look like. And then we call the intent. And then what the user does is you'll see a list of what programs do you want to run. When you want to say, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with Android, you can say you could take a picture. You could say, oh, it'll say you have a share button. What happens when you hit share? Share basically is looking for uh, applications that will accept that mine, that mine type. For instance, if you have a, a JPEG image, it looks for, uh, because what you can do is you can, because uh, in addition to apps being able to launch intents, we can also receive them as well. So basically, uh, the, and they come in two basic forms if you're a receiver. One are system events. For instance, we can register for system events. One of my, the app that I wrote, it uh, launches at startup. How does it launch for startup? It's, it's allowed through the permissions to, to know when the system boot has finished booting. Once it knows it's finished booting, then it, then it does what's called, they have what it's kind of, it's a lot all at once, but they have broadcast receivers, and the broadcast receiver receives the event and does whatever, and that sort of starts the whole process for my app of how to start monitoring um, a restful state thing. For instance, here, if we do the, uh, We can make our, if we want, we can make our own uh, broadcast messages and other stuff. I'm so basically just the, and the most default thing is we, we need, uh, the first thing we need is wh where is it coming from? And then where do we want to go to? We created a new activity. So that. And then we say start activity. This is an explicit intent. Because basically what I'm saying is I've told, uh, is we're deliberately trying to, because uh, what we're going to do from, from this, this is where, this is basically, this tells the intent where is it coming from, which is the name of this class file, this, this is the actual instance of this activity, and this is the uh, activity that we want to uh, that we want. One of the things we can other we can do too is you can you can do what, what are, we can say i dot put extra, and we can we can do name value pairs of whatever. Just so for instance, if you're so, so, for instance, if you want to pass data between the intents, if, for instance, you wanted to just create an email message, you could set up the, you know, the, the sender, the receiver, the body, and fire everything off for this one. And then if we hit new button, I fired off an explicit intent. That intent said load my second activity I created. And this will um, create the, uh, you no, know, this is just the one that we've created here. You have to forgive the, uh, but yeah, we can just sit here and go back and forth. We can go, we can go back. There's all sorts of, uh, the other thing to here, just to sort of show you as far as the other, uh, Intents go is we can create a uh, as we can create instead of doing that we can say uh, So this one here, because we this is how for this is how for instance with Android apps we can we sort of reach beyond our uh, 
thing here. This is actually going to, we're going to open a web browser inside the, uh, It, it, it doesn't for this. Wow. We can actually, actually, I don't think we have we have many. Actually, let me check. I may actually have to do. Oh, we'll see. Probably should, but. Yeah. Now if I hit new button, I've just fired up the web browser inside the, uh, the, the, the AVD. Uh, if, uh, for instance, uh, we were to do something, that now there's another one called, you know, I'll, I'll just demonstrate for you. Those are explicits because those are kind of saying what we want to do. The other one we can do is what's called the implicit, where basically what will happen is, because we're programmatically saying where do we want to go and what we want to do. With an implicit intent, you can ask the user what they want to do. So if I was to... Uh, do this and create use action send instead. Now we can specify a mime type. Fire it off again. So the, see, there's sort of like I mean, and this is just sort of from our app. The other thing we can do too, and I'm not getting into because it's just going to complicate everything. Is how do we do? Um, you know, how would we do this? You know, because we we can set up all sorts. Of, we can set up uh, receivers, so we can start instead of sitting there being the one that fires it off, we can be the one to receive uh, these types of events. So if I go here. Now it's doing implicit. It's now asking the user, which is us, what do you want to do? If you've ever clicked something and had this kind of action, this is what the app's doing. It's creating an implicit intent. Now if I was to click, if I was to say messaging and hit always, then it would always default to if there was a text plane intent fired off, it would uh, go off. But that's... Uh, but that, that's essential. That's sort of like just sort of what I want to do here. I mean, there's a lot more we can do programmatically, but the big thing I wanted to demonstrate here, as far as if you're a new app developer getting started, is number one, sort of how the permissions work, because you probably want to do things with your Android device, so you got to be aware of when those exceptions happen. How to, you know, sort of how to do basic uh, debugging and how to do um, how to do your your basic debugging and sort of an introduction to an intents, because intents are kind of how we uh, sort of reach, we, we make our apps, you know, talk to do other stuff or reach out to uh, other apps. Now, one thing I'll show here is if I open, I'm just going to, uh, now this one here, just to sort of show, uh, this is the actual, the app that I uh, put together and actually This is what I've actually, because what I'm going to show you is that this app here actually uh, runs on, uh, we have on uh, Google, oh, it's going to index, but actually what, well, let's going through here, indexing. All right, one of the things here I just wanted to show while that's actually firing up is uh, one of the ways that we can, we can download the app is through uh, Google Play. Like you're all familiar, if you've used an Android device, you're probably familiar with the uh, the Play Store. This is actually the listing for the app that uh, that I did. So you can see here, this actually just sort of shows things. You can say install. It'll show some. Uh, you have some screenshots. There's a description, reviews, and there's uh, just some stats about the app that's uh, down here as well. They recommend some other things. Remember how I said we can do um, 
you know, the permissions, the saying here, this is taking the, uh, the, the permissions in my Android manifest file and translating them into like human English, but I have these two permissions in there. So this is what's uh, going on there. And this is sort of, one of the things to look at too is um, just a little thing is uh, for the URL is actually the, uh, the URL is the fully, for, for all the, um, all the software, or all the uh, apps, pardon me, in the Play Store is identified by the fully qualified um, name of the main activity class for that app. So in this thing here, if we go to, uh, if we were to go to my, uh, my, my actual, what's my score is the name of my main activity for my app, which is listed here. Now this is what it looks like if you're the user. Now if we were to go to the other side here, because probably this is how we can publish it, is uh, this is the developer council, council for Google Play. In order to publish to Google Play, it's $25. That's a one-time fee to get access to it. One of the things to keep in mind when you are publishing to Google Play is when you first publish, there are some they, they do a bit of a code analysis to make sure you're not trying to do anything too evil in your code. There's also, you'll, if you read stories, you'll read stories about developers who publish code because there are rules for what you can and cannot put in your code. Let's say, for instance, you were to, uh, you know, you, you could potentially, you could take a picture of somebody standing in front of a Starbucks cafe and then your app could run afoul of the fact you have a Starbucks trademarked thing in your screenshot. There's people who've done that. Then the app gets pulled down, and they're like, ah, and it just sort of changed the screen. This one for here, if we go actually to what's so this actually this this says publish. This is where basically you get to because um, what happens is when you uh, when when you actually want to publish, what you first thing you want to do is you want to create a uh, a production APK file. Once you have your APK file. Uh, you want to uh, come here. This is where, for instance, we can change all the the title of my app, of the app. We can give a short description. We can give a better description, like a full description. Uh, you need to provide some graphic assets. You need to provide uh, some screenshots. So do some screenshots of your app that you can do. Uh, you can do screen. You can do like this one here is just basic for phone. But we can also, if you want, you can do screenshots for seven inch tablets, you can do screenshots for 10 inch tablets for TV. You can do a high res icon. This is an icon that shows up. You can do a uh, feature graphic. They have more banners here. You get to um, do, uh, you have your, you have your uh, applications. You can do an email. The other thing too to keep in mind that when you uh, publish your, uh, your APK, it, one of the things uh, it does is it will only show if uh, your app only supports 4.0 and above Android. Users who don't have, who have Android less than 4.0 will never see your app listed in the Play Store. So that's a little thing they control. Hey, one of the things you can also do too here inside the developer, account, like here we can go APK. For instance, they have a thing here and I can, I can do alpha testing. I can specify who gets access to it, beta testing. I can. It will tell me based on what I've done, how many currently Android devices I support, what my version are. I can publish more uh, things here. We have uh, if uh, your app crashes, it'll tell you can you can find out if your app's crashing on people's devices. You can get crash uh, reports. You can see your ratings uh, in reviews. They also do. You can see basic statistics for your device, how many people have used it, loaded it, all that kind of stuff. You can find out how many, uh, you know, how many, uh, you know, what, what type of installs by de based on device, it'll break it down. Uh, the one thing too to mention when you, if you decide you want to publish on a, uh, on Google Play is you have the ability to make the, uh, the app, uh, you can make it a paid app or you can make it a, uh, a free app. If anything you, uh, if you do any form of pay, uh, re uh, the Google takes 40%. You know, if you charge one dollar, 40 cents of that dollar will go to Google. Um, there are other app stores that do other rules, but the rule is 40%. You also have the ability, you can set up in-app advertisements. Uh, the the actual, from what I've heard, I've heard somebody, I've heard people say uh, 
stats say that somebody had 10,000 installs of their app, they used the Google ads, and they were making about 75 cents a day for, by serving ads. So the amount of money, a lot of people think, oh, I'll build a, uh, an app, I'll have like, I don't know, I'll make lots of money off the ads, you're not. There's not a lot of money. You know, I've heard about somebody who had 400,000 installs and they were making about $150 a day on, on their app. If you notice a lot of the gaming companies, just for thing, they don't actually use the uh, Google ads. They do their own ads, but you, but you gotta be very, but that's the other thing too, if you do, is you can't, if you do wanna do like banner ads on your app and you go through Google Play, you have to use their services. If you try to use somebody else's, they'll pull your app down from the store. So G Google's really big. You can read all sorts of stories about people who've run afoul of you know, the Google Play rules. There are other app stores and you have to play by their rules, whatever those are. That's something you have to consider is when you get involved. If you're gonna write an app, you have to, um, whatever, wherever you publish, you have to play by their rules. Same thing if you're to do an app for Apple. The other thing I'll, uh, I'll mention too is what about games? There is something called uh, the Native Development Kit, which allows you to do, you can actually do C++ on Android, which is where a lot of the games are. And they use uh, the Java Native interface to, uh, call, to go between uh, the Java and the C++ calls. But this is typically, you know, there's not a, I mean, yeah, you can, do, you can do some Java games, but typically, I don't know, Angry Birds, any of those other big games. They're, uh, they're, they're, they are written uh, using uh, the, the, you know, the native development kit. The other thing too I'll say is typically most apps, it's not a good way to make money because whatever you've done, there's probably already 20 of them out there on the app store. So if you have some grand idea, I'm gonna build an app. Like there are the Instagrams, but then again, how many other picture sharing apps are there that you can share a picture through an app and you can rate it. Instagram's not the only one, it just so happens they're the biggest one. When you hear people talking, oh, I'm gonna write an app and I'm gonna be rich, I'm gonna be the next Instagram, I'm gonna be whatever, the chances are really small because you know a lot of the a lot of the apps on the Play Store, quite frankly, are never downloaded. I think I'm up to about 29, which I, I mean I don't promote it or anything like that, but those are just little caveats I sort of put out there. Um, if you uh, do decide you want to get into app development, and uh, that's basically I'm gonna about wrap it up. That's eh, about about an hour there, I think that's about enough for me. But um, yeah, hopefully that gives you sort of enough to, to get you started, make you wanna get started and uh, try it out for yourself. All right, thank you very much.